Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. If you find value in what we do and you'd like to support the podcast, go to coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash alone, or you can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here today with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and we are going to answer some questions. Uh, first, though, we are going to go into what we did this week. So, Holly. Um, this week was really, really rough. Um, I mean, I got a lot done. Um, I'm working on my Ohio novel. I'm doing the revision. Uh, Matt did his edits, and he kicked my ass in a whole bunch of different places. <laughs> and this was the point where I hit the really big changes that I have to start making in the middle um, to, and, and it was, it was like three steps forward and two steps back all week long. Um, I was going through chapters and I would come out at the end of the day having just cut and, and cut stuff out and then built stuff in and I'd have maybe 120, 200, 300 words and the next day would be the same and the next day would be the same and I think and one day I came out negative numbers um, and I made it through four chapters of revision this week and uh, I came out with about 1200 words so and each of those was a really long chapter and all of several of them had to be completely rewritten um, it was, it was, oh God, it was grueling, but it is really coming together. And I am so excited. Part of one of the changes that Matt mentioned to you, you, you told me was, um, and, and this is something that I wanted to point out because this is part of what a content editor would do. Mm -hmm. Um, he, this has Holly's main vision in mind. So he knows what she wants to achieve with this book. It's not just a single book. It's a series. And one of the changes he suggested was the male protagonist. Oh, correct? yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He said, you wrote the wrong guy. You need a different male, for, um, um, male protagonist, a male lead, because the guy you've got is just wrong. He's, you know, and, and also, you know way too much about him at the beginning. And if this is going to be a long series, um, he has to be a mystery in the first one. And um, it was just it's like, oh. God, you're so right. Oh, crap. Why didn't I see that? Yeah. So um, a lot of this has been removing main character from the first chapters completely. And he is at this, I am, like I said, right now at about the midpoint. Um, she is about to meet him for the first time. And it's going to be an interesting meeting. And he is going to be a very small presence in the first book. Um, compelling, but small. Yeah, so, and I wanted to mention that. Specific, and, and of course, a content <clears throat> editor won't tell you you wrote the wrong guy. That's it's the, the the relationship between Holly and Matt is different than what it would be if if Holly was a client of his and yes. not his wife. So, yes, um, he's been clobbering my books for 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so and they know each other very, yeah. very well. And I know that if he says something, he's right. So, you know, I just in spite of it, the fact that it's frequently not what I want to hear, I just say, okay, yep, yep, you're right, because he is. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, and we're going to do an episode with Matt coming up, and we wanted to know what your questions were regarding what a content editor does. We're also going to um, talk to him about basically what he suggests for people to do before they get the book to an editor or a content editor. So that's, that's something he is not looking for clients currently. We are not going to be advertising his site or his, um, his work because right. he is absolutely full up. But for a future episode, we are looking for questions. So right. was there anything else as far as your week? Um, that was, that was really it. Um, I 
man, oh, I, I did realize that I am going to have to add a new lesson, a brand new lesson in how to revise your novel. And I am holding off on doing the revision on that class, which I was planning on being about halfway through right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have learned so much from doing this particular novel uh, that uh, it has just changed the way I look at revision. Um, and I am, it, the, all of the begin, all of the essential stuff that's already there is still there. Mm -hmm. But I have an extra step I've got to add. <laughs> yeah, and again, this is this is stuff that you would you would learn to incorporate anyway. So, but yeah, right. I, um, so, and that was your week then. That was my week. Yes. Okay. Um, I am going through a bit of a of a, an upheaval, and I can't believe it's been almost an exact uh, month since my friend died because it does not feel like that. And it's still it hitting me quite often, so I'm I'm going through some of that. I'm switching my, I, I'm changing my routines and schedules around. So when I say that I got one day of work in, and three scenes revised during that day, it's actually a very very good thing, <laughs> but it doesn't <laughs> sound like it is. Um, I I think that this is important for some people is. And I, I read this in The Miracle Morning, which I'm rereading, that's by Hal Elrod. Um, it's not something that I'm going to be incorporating in my morning mornings because that doesn't work out for my schedule. But when Tony leaves, I'm going to, to start doing that again because it puts me in the right focus for fiction. Mm -hmm. And if you guys haven't read the book, it's it's a very good book. I'll put a link in, a show no in the show notes. But I think that this is important for people because you get into a routine and then you start to um, lose focus or lose motivation or lose you start to get a little complacent mm -hmm. so I am switching things up I'm working pretty much Tony's exact hours so that we have the time together that he is off and I take the days off that he's off instead of working and only spending a couple of hours with him. Um, but the thing in, in Hal Elrod's book, the quote was, um, basically this is like, okay, well, if it's gotten boring, whose fault is that? And whose responsibility is it to make it exciting again? And that's nice. Yeah. And it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't something he said. It was something he, he was quoting a sales manager that told him that. And I, that really struck me as, okay, yeah, that's why that hit me this time. Cause I've read the book before, but mm -hmm. it hit me this time because I needed it to hit me this time. Um, yeah. Well, books are like that. You'll, you'll find a bunch of stuff that you need one time. You'll read the book years later and you'll find a bunch of other stuff. that's completely different. Yeah. That you need. Yeah. And, and it can be weeks later. Um, it just depends on how quickly your life is changing, how quickly you're, you're changing things. But um, my routine had been so ingrained that it was, I was starting to have some problems with it. I was starting to procrastinate. I was starting to get a little complacent. So I realized I needed to change things. Um, and if you are in that spot where when it's your writing time, you're procrastinating we've gone over this before if we've got several different things you can check our our backlog of of um podcast episodes like muse toys or how to write when you don't feel like writing that sort of thing but i suggest like a routine change can be one of the fixes just changing up the, your day and that's what i've done so i I was off on Tuesday and Wednesday. Monday was a crazy day. It was crazy and I did not have any time whatsoever to get any um, of the writing in. So Thursday, I was fighting some of that depression from realizing that it's almost a month since she's been gone, but yeah. I had the, the paperwork in front of me. I kept drifting off and then I would turn back to the revision, turn back to the revision. And I'm very, very proud that I got three scenes and I was going to force myself to go through the fourth one. And I said, you know what? No, I got three. 
I can do Mm -hmm. more tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. It was a step in the right direction and I'm excited to see what I get done today. And that's one of the things with depression is that at you, you, the, the times when things actually start to click, it's so tempting to push yep. too far and push too hard and say, yeah, I'm back. And, and it's a slow hole to crawl out of. Mm-hmm. So if you can, if you can get something and, and like what you got and still know that you have a little gas in the tank, that's the time to stop. Because if you are still able to think, yeah, okay, I, this is a good place to stop and I can do some more tomorrow. That's way better than grinding and grinding and, and putting yourself back in the place where you feel like crap. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're getting you start to feel that momentum and then you're Mm -hmm. like, okay, well I have to keep it going just in case I'm completely gone tomorrow. But it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. No, that's the way to guarantee that you'll be completely gone tomorrow. Yeah. Is if you keep going and keep going and you, it's just this neurological link that you're setting up in your head. Mm -hmm. And it's like when you start to think of writing, you're going to feel that burnout. So if if you can push through, I mean, I have been so depressed on certain days where I got one scene revised, or not one scene, but like one or two pages of the scene revised, and then I had to stop because it was just too much emotion, too much of, of you know, my super depressing and this was pre this was around clomid time so this was two years ago something like that but um it was it was not good but just getting part of what your goal is done can be success you just have to adjust your idea of success for that day or that situation yeah i think it's somebody somebody called that managing your expectations Mm -hmm. where you you say, okay, well, this is a point in my life where I need to be a little easier on myself. So I don't have to be superwoman today. I can just be somebody who gets a little bit done. Yeah. 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 One of the things that I was looking at was, okay, well, when I was 14, when I was 17, when I was 21, how many words was I getting by day, you know, and I can look back and it's like, oh, five, six thousand words. Yeah, but at the <laughs> yeah, same but. time, I didn't have a husband that I have chosen to cook for. Uh, he is also kind of a slob, so I have to clean. But I am also kind of uh, a wreck when it comes to house cleaning. So it's like I have all of these other things that I have to get done. I now have a podcast as well. And I am also battling this this depression stuff. So I have to manage my expectations of what I can do without burning out and also give myself a decent like a a decent success point because I I think it has to be something that is achievable but it has to be something that is also challenging and fun Mm -hmm. exactly that's I had I had a thing on my blog years ago um that we did for a while it was called uh write a book with me and the goal for the day for folks who were playing along was 250 words Yeah. I think one of your, um, once you had to stop and you were doing something else or you published that book or something, one of the other, uh, quite a few of the other people had picked it up Mm -hmm. and now you can walk through the, the walk through, you can go through the forums and and find the write a book with me for, uh, forum threads, which is like whatever, write a, uh, W A B M. I don't Mm -hmm. think there's the other the other w in there but i don't think yeah i think it's wabm yeah yeah and that's just it's really cool so if you are looking for someone to for some accountability because that can be very difficult when you're a solo writer and you don't have very many friends if you're looking for accountability um go into the forums this just say like i want to do a write a book with me is anybody starting one or even start your own and start with a goal like 250 words or 10 minute timer a day or whatever your goal is. Yeah. So um, that is it for this the, these weeks. Let's get into the questions. All right. The first one um, is what if it's boring to me, meaning to the writer? So basically, like, how do you know if what you are writing 
is boring in general or if you've just been over it so many times that it is boring to you. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, this is both a very easy and a very difficult question. The easy part is if you read it and it's boring to you, it is boring. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's just no way to soften that. If you have, you have made some mistakes in the writing, if you're not, I can, I can read through my stuff and that's, at the point where I find that I'm losing my own attention, that just comes out because I did it wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, um, and realize too that we are people who have gone through and read the same sentence, the same paragraph, the same scene multiple, multiple, multiple times. Like I, there's a difference between getting sick of reading your your mm-hmm. stuff and being bored by it and right. with glass house i read so many of those scenes so many times i was just like oh my god but i wasn't <laughs> bored by the parts that i knew were coming up or i i still felt excitement even if something was written incorrectly or i had to change some things i still felt excitement about mm-hmm. how i had written certain things yeah yeah there is even it is really nice, and this is why, this is the the biggest reason why you don't read something immediately after you wrote it. You you write your book, you let it sit for a month, and then, and I know this is hard because you're going, I want to read it, I want to read it. Don't. Wait a month, and then go in and read it. And every single time you make yourself laugh, that's a win. Every sem- single time you tear up at something that you wrote, that's a win. That you have this emotional connection. You go, okay, no, no matter what I have to fix about this, that stays because I got that right. Every time you get a solid emotional reaction from yourself, that's a keeper. Yeah. At the point where you find yourself skimming your own words, stop, mark the point where you lost your own attention, keep reading, keep going, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote this. And at the point where that stops, mark it again, because that's got to go. Yeah. That's you, you have, you have told instead of showing, that is almost always the exact problem where somebody has decided to do an info dump and explain something. Mm -hmm. And explanations, info dumps are mind numbing. Or there's so many details. Oh, or like God. like you said, the tell not show isn't necessarily an info dump. And I want to point that out because you kind of gelled them together. But yeah. an info dump is like that huge exposition thing where you, you learn the past of somebody or you, he meets somebody and you get like their history, their their credits, like whatever the hell they are. Or a beat by beat description of a character. Yes. Uh, the, the, and the description like that's that is like just unnecessary but that's a different podcast but yeah Yeah. the 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 info dump and the showing not telling is different because show not tell is if you're writing about a character and you're writing about what they did instead of what they're doing Mm -hmm. and i i know you still catch yourself doing this i i i am fixing that in this book right now where I'm talking about a character who, I mean, not write this, you know, scene, but it's where you're talking about a character who has taken care of certain things that should have been on the page because it would be interesting. It would be cool. It would be way better. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, this isn't, this isn't just noobs that make this mistake. This is people who've been doing this for a really long time who have professionally, who still make this mistake from time to time because there is just this part of your brain that says, oh, I know how to get that out. I'm just going to put it all out in this one big block and then we're going to have it. Yeah. But there's there's a lot of reasons why it might be boring to you too. Maybe it's, maybe the scene isn't actually doing anything. Oh yeah. Uh, Sitting and thinking about something uh, that happened before. Well, I mean, it can just be somebody going out shopping and or going, you know, maybe it's an action scene, but it doesn't lead anywhere. There's no purpose to it. That mm-hmm. can be boring, too. Even it, the w- most well-written action scene can be boring if there's no stakes. Right. 
um, if you already know, and, and this is getting a little bit deeper. This isn't just the, the beginner idea of, of new, but if you already know that the character can fight anybody and has every magical power <laughs> yes. known to man and then just randomly comes up with brand new stuff, I mean, oh, that's going to get boring. Oh, fast. Yeah. Uh, and I'll note one other thing. One writer who I genuinely like, but who is going to remain nameless for this, uh, was bragging about the fact that he wrote a 150-page chase scene in a novel that was published um, that he is, you know, he is a massively successful professional. And uh, I, my brain ditched at about f page five of the chase scene. I, I couldn't finish the book. You know, so he did it, and he managed to talk his editor into putting it out there like that, but it sucked. It was boring. It was mind-numbingly boring because it was just these two people chasing, this one person chasing this other person and continually not catching them over different obstacles mm -hmm. for, the, what, 150, 200 pages. It's like, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure somebody out there probably thought it was cool or, you know, it, again, it, there is a relative uh, relativity when it comes to boring but to oh, yeah. me as a human being who loves to read this wide expanse of of books and topics and everything um yeah 150 page chase scene mm -hmm. does not sound interesting if you if you read uh, robert mccammon's mine that whole book is basically a chase scene and it's amazing it is it is just it is incredible but it, it's that's it's kind of like that genre. It's like a a chase book. Mm -hmm. It is a stalk and 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 um try to get my my baby back kind of chase scene. Uh, that's a little different. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not 150 pages of one individual chase scene. That just oh dear God, that just does not sound interesting. One individual <laughs> chasing another individual through a building. I couldn't do it. I can no, do it. I can. Oh, yeah. But that that's that's another example of boring is if if you ha like obviously that that chase scene is an extreme example but <laughs> yes. even if you are looking at okay, well why is this boring me? I don't feel it's written badly. It's not show don't tell. Maybe it's something to do with you already know how all of this is going to end and yeah you're the writer but you have to be able to take a look at okay well what are the stakes in this scene because if there are no stakes a perfectly good scene can be boring right right and this so so let's just for a second here look at what needs to be in a scene and I know we've gone over this in other episodes but because this is a question and this is the answer to well what if it's boring to me this is how you fix that you look at your main character your 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 protagonist for the scene which may or may not be the protagonist for the book but the the person who is doing the stuff in this scene is the protagonist for that scene you look at that character's conflict what what problem does that character have to overcome or make worse or in some way change in this scene? This is, this is the thing the scene exists to move forward. Um, you have to look at where it's set. Is it set in the right place? Is it set anywhere? A lot of times when you are reading something of your own that's boring, when you look at it, you realize that it's happening in like the the all white invisible room with nothing in it it's just that this vacuum of description yeah. yeah it's yeah it's just a vacuum of step-by-step -step action wh that doesn't happen anywhere that is not affected by things like weather or rushing water coming towards you or something about to explode one place over or a ticking some sort of ticking time bomb or some something that matters that that is part of the setting yeah um you have to look at who else is in the scene and what do they bring to it and and do they bring anything to it because you, if you have your neighbors talking to each other and they're talking about something inconsequential and nothing happens around them um and, the, and there's no there's no conflict 
and and t- talking gossiping about a third party is not conflict um and people do it all the time in scenes and it causes very boring scenes um if the character is suddenly tipping off the wife that her husband is cheating on her that's a conflict Mm -hmm. you know that's a different kind of thing you have to see what is in the scene that you could change to make it interesting yeah because no matter how boringly written something is if you can figure out why it matters to the story you can fix it yeah yeah so was there anything else to the question of you know it, it being boring for you as the writer I think that's pretty much it. It's just, it's always a problem. If it's boring to you, there is always a problem with the scene. Yeah. Um, you know, you can be tired of reading and rereading something and still make yourself laugh or still make yourself get a little teary-eyed. Or when you, you get still, to the I mean, it matter. doesn't even have to be that extreme. You can still like the scene that you've written. You can still like mm-hmm. the the words on the page and everything and just be tired of reading it over and over yeah. and over again boring is a completely different thing yeah it, boring is if the if you find yourself skimming you have just found a problem that needs to be fixed yeah so the next question is uh how do you write flashbacks or dream premonitions well oftentimes these come across weird because the information can often be disseminated in a different fashion in the story but whether because of the limited point of view the limited skill or knowledge of the the point of view character or the limited unreliable narrator it becomes necessary um cover that necessary thing there for the first because that that is an assumption yeah um <laughs> there there is no point in a book where a premonition or flashback is necessary Unless you are writing uh, a telepathic character mm-hmm. and the story is based on premonitions. Or if and, you're writing a, a book like Memento, you know, the movie, mm-hmm. where the flashbacks it's, are the point. Right, where, where the story is told backwards mm-hmm. and the character finds the way to the beginning by starting at the end and working through a sequential series of previous flashbacks. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really good. Yeah, um, but yeah. the 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 things that she pointed out were not reasons why it would make a flashback or a dream premonition necessary ever. Correct? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So so let's look at what what dreams and premonitions are awesome for. Um, dreams are excellent for and premonitions. This is the same thing. I'm going to just kind of bundle bundle them all into dreams, but dreams and premonitions. Mm-hmm. Um, they are excellent for introducing a character's fears and hopes. Um, you can show through this dream, the character wanting to be this magnificent hero or this girl wanting to be walking down the aisle with this particular guy who doesn't like her or who has a, a, a premonition of uh, a woman who has a premonition of her child suddenly being snatched in the grocery store and and taken away. Um, But then when you do this, you know, that's a really good way of showing things that they fear, um, things that they want, things that they are passionate about. Um, You can use uh, premonitions, dreams, nightmares, uh, that wake characters into existing real world situations, and you know, yeah. let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, like um, it, when you're dreaming and and there's the like a, a weird noise, and it's worked yourself into worked itself into the dream, and when you wake up, that noise is still there, and it's not a noise that you're used to, uh, so your subconscious has alerted you to it and and woken you up slowly to that. Yeah, that that can introduce some interesting conflict into a scene as well. Right. Right. That's, that's cool stuff. Um, you can use a dream or a premonition to expose a character's flaws. Um, if you write a villain who is sleeping or if you write, if you write a guy that, that, that nobody has met before who is dreaming and you know that he is dreaming 
and he is dreaming about being the king of the world and having a bunch of slaves and having all of these women at his feet uh, who are doing things that they don't want to do. And this is this is this massive, scary power fantasy. Mm-hmm. And then he wakes up and he's he's this this guy in a, a single uh, room apartment and with a menial uh, job or something like with that. With a menial yeah. job, uh, and then you have someone that you have shown two sides to, and one side of them suggests a, a certain amount of danger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a nice bit of characterization. That is a cool way to to show somebody and then show him working through the menial life. But in the back of your mind, you always know that there is this other part that's in there that isn't showing up yet. And then you build on that. And you show these little things that he's doing to gain the kind of power that he wants to control people. Yeah. And, you know, the guy who is trying to control people is always the villain. Um, so that's, you yeah. know, that's some good stuff that you can get in there. Okay. Um, that was... The that premonitions, was, there was one more thing that you mentioned in there as well, which was uh, a way to mislead. Oh, God, yes. Um, yeah, if you have a premonition and and you have somebody who... And I've done this, man. I woke up from this crazy-ass nightmare in which uh, I said, we are going... I walked out. I, it was so bad. It got me up. I got out of bed. I walked across the room. This was when we were living in Florida the first time. And I told Matt the, the remark down the date on this. Um, I, I just had this horrific premonition of a Category 5 hurricane walking over us on this date. We need to make sure that we are not going to be here on this date. And he looked at me and he said, okay. And he wrote it down and he said, go back to bed. And I went back to sleep. And I pinged about it for about a month and there was no hurricane there was absolutely nothing you know and you can do that to a character you can have this person who is just going nuts and trying to make all of these preparations and stuff and is sure that this is a big thing that's going to happen whatever it is and then there is stugats man yeah there is just nothing it's it's (laughs) like uh, the example that you had used when we were talking about this before was a psychic who gets these premonitions about murders, mm-hmm. um, but is, like, in, in the book, she's assuming one thing. Like, you can even show her the face of somebody, and she's dead set that this is the killer, but she's wrong. Maybe yeah. the face was in there because it was going to be another victim. Maybe the face was in there was because he was somehow accidentally tied to the murder. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's good to, if you still have a psychic, still have their premonitions add conflict right there is no there is no time in which giving somebody an easy way out is the right thing to do in fiction not ever if if this is going to make it easier for them you're doing it wrong because your job is to throw obstacles in the way of the hero and make them harder and meaner and tougher yeah and it, it's it's about limitations right so if you've set up these limitations for your fiction you got to figure out a different way to get them the information that they need without it being a, a premonition or a flashback because those, especially as a reader, if you're going through and a premonition pops up, it's like, oh, really? Mm-hmm. That's that's how this... And I've, I've seen it happen in books where it wasn't even a fantasy um, or a um sci-fi or any or a horror or a paranormal book. yeah or yeah. a paranormal book it was none of that it was it was and then suddenly they had the answer and that is one of the more frustrating things as a reader because as you're reading this along you are eager to see how they put this stuff together you mm-hmm. want to see how they solve the issue and if the writer does something like that then as a reader you feel cheated and you mm-hmm. feel like they had they copped out. And right. If you are a writer and you do that, you are cheating. That's I, I have I have frequently said that the, the point of magic, and if you are using dreams, and if you are using premonitions, and they have some actual connection to your real world, they become a form of magic. 
in that case, the use of magic in good fiction is to make things harder for the character, to add obstacles, to, to create conflicts. It is never to solve them. The character has to solve them with innate ability, with intelligence, with skill, um, overcoming obstacles that are magic, which, you know, if you don't have magic, is a big damn deal. And if you do have magic, it has to backfire. Yeah. It has to make things harder. It has to be, which is why in most fantasy novels, um, w in most epic fantasies, the protagonist starts out as a complete noob who knows nothing. Because if he has magic, he has to learn how to use it. And learning how to use it creates flaws and accidents and makes things harder. It can't ever make things easier. The best way I've heard Holly put this was that magic needs to backfire and that the, the character needs to solve the problem with the things that we all have. Because mm -hmm. that's how your reader can relate to the character. That's how the reader feels more connected to the character, to the writer, to everything, to that world. Is if the character, even with all of these magic things at his or her disposal, is unable to solve the problem until he uses he or she uses something that we all have human skills yeah yeah yeah, yeah which I really liked yeah I mean it, um, it, if it's a sci-fi you can use futuristic tech but it has to be logic or it has to be um the the human part of them that is using this that figured out okay this is how you use this to to fix this problem yeah um, there is one other item, one other really cool thing you can do with premonitions uh, and with dreams that, you know, can add to the book. It is a really cool way to show some, the reader some world-building secrets about the universe. Um, it's if, if you are having a character uh, who suddenly starts having nightmares about dragons and then something happens and the reader is actually, or the, the character is actually now confronted by a real dragon, um, that's cool. That's, that's showing or discovers an egg and it's a big egg. And he's had this dream about dragons and, you know, all of a sudden he has this egg. And so he decides to take it home and hatch it. Uh, it's cooler if it turns out to be an alligator because... <laughs> You know, then then he has made a big mistake and he has something carnivorous in his house that might eat him. But, you know, if, if, if you've already established that it's a fantasy world and the, the dream introduces him to the existence of dragon eggs and he goes out and hunts around and finds an egg and brings it home and it's a dragon. OK, that's that's an interesting way to start a story. Um, but then it needs to end there. You can't you can't keep having the character dream things that come true. And generally, if they come true, they need to come true in really unexpected ways. So it's, I think that we've covered this pretty well. If you still have questions on how to write dream premonitions well, uh, dreams or, you know, slash premonitions or flashbacks, come into the forum thread regarding this episode and leave us, you know, more specific questions. If you are not understanding something that we have mentioned here, then then put it in there too. We're, we're not saying you can't tell the reader something through these things. It's just you have to be smart about how you do it. Right. You, you know, you can, for, for advanced writers, um, I guess you, you can hide the truth in the mm -hmm. misconceptions in there as well. Right. But you don't ever answer the questions that way. Yeah. So the next question, and this one was from the same writer. How do you keep from creating an info dump near the climax of a story when the only point of view is from a character that has been kept in the dark until they finally find the person place with the answers? And this then leads them to the final conflict and all of it is in a quick paced set of events. So I'm assuming that, like, how do you, the, the question is basically, how do you keep from info dumping the answers that the, the character needs in order to reach that climax and the resolution? Right. When everything is, and 
everything is going to move quickly after that. So how do you, yeah, that's breaking the pace too. Right, right, it is. And this is really important. And it's a hard thing to learn. Um, I did this in my first novel, the the one that didn't get published, um, where I, I had a bunch of mysteries and right up at the end, I answered everything all in one big block of text. And um, it, I did it in a, in a way that revealed um, stuff that the character hadn't known to that point. And it, what it did, the effect that this had, was it made the character look like an idiot through the entire book because she never figured out anything out on her own. She never, ever said, oh, you know, if I put this thing together with this thing, then that raises this interesting question that I might want to follow up on. Mm-hmm. Um, and and she, she did, man. She was in the first draft. Now, like I said, I eventually, over seven years, <laughs> revised and revised and re-revised that book to the point where I got somebody to offer me 500 bucks for it as a one-time thing, at which point I pulled it and said, no, that's not going to be my first novel. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's about the the lack of knowledge on their part, but also the lack of action in trying to figure it out. Right. Right. Your main character has to be active. Your main character starts out being the one who knows the least, but he or she cannot be the one that ends up that way. Um, You have a good character figures things out as they go. Um, So you do not, the thing you most importantly do not want to do with this is you do not want to make the person that your readers are supposed to like a clueless idiot throughout the entire book. Yeah. So your your character starts out knowing the least, but but has to show some skill and intelligence and courage and integrity and daring and, you know, to take on some obstacles and to do things to figure this out so that the reader gets to do it with them. Yeah. Because that's the fun of reading the book. It isn't having an answer handed to you at the end. It's figuring it out maybe half a step behind the main character who's figuring out as he or she goes. Now, one one person who does an exception to that, but also leaves all of the clues out for you, and she's already nodding. She knows who I'm going to mention. Oh, yeah. Is, is per, and I'm sorry that I've become Holly on this, is Lawrence Block. Um <laughs> It's, it's ridiculous because you guys had to hear so much about him from Holly for the first year and a half. And now it's me. If you really want good examples of this, um, Scudder novels by Lawrence Block. And so far, that's the only ones I've read. Be, uh, and I love Matt Scudder. Mm-hmm. Um, are really, really good examples. There's only been one that I wasn't crazy about. Um, and if you start from the beginning... It's important because you get all of these little bits and pieces, but you also see how he starts to do it better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the first one to me, I felt kind of obvious who the bad guy was. But again, it was, you know, the 1960s when that one was written, I think. (laughs) It might have been. And things have changed and things that, you know, might be more obvious to folks now weren't, weren't back then. But if you continue to read all of this, I would highly suggest A Long Line of Dead Men. That one was incredible. The surprise in that one got me 100%. Now, he's had a couple in there that were, as soon as it's revealed who the the perp is, um, it's like, oh, come on, really? Damn it. I liked that person, or I didn't see that coming. But A Long Line of Dead Men got me 100%. Like, I was floored. And the bits and pieces were there that Mm -hmm. if I had... And it's like you just can't pay enough attention. You go into these books thinking, okay, I'm going to pay attention. This time I'm going to get you blocked. No. (laughs) So far, no. Um, And and that's a good thing to do is that, yes, it's better probably... Um, in many genres, if the reader is with you, if the reader is is with the character and figuring things out, just a step behind them. Mm-hmm. But for, I think, the detective novel, for something that is all about reading and then you want that shock value at the end, mm-hmm. that's a different, that's a 
that that is one where you do want to try to leave the reader as as surprised as possible at the climax. Right, but the character is never a clueless noob. No. The, the no. main character is never bewildered. The main character knows what's going on. Well, they can and, feel bewildered, but they're yeah. never just absolutely dumb the entire uh, the entire book. Right. You they know? never have to have somebody tell them what happened. Yeah. They they are putting the pieces together and they are showing you the pieces, but you're just not seeing them as the pieces because he is just that good. Yeah, with with Block, but even <laughs> with, with Block, your own Block. writing and stuff, it's mm-hmm. it you can have a character have all of these different pieces. Put some red herrings in there. Have them try to figure out how this goes with that and this goes with that and this other thing over here maybe that's something have them try to put it together wrong and then if you want one person at the end when they're meeting somebody and and they meet that one person that you're talking about in the question maybe they they obviously they don't need this big info dump but maybe they can just say something that triggers this avalanche in the main character's mind of i had the pieces but i had the puzzle backwards Mm mm-hmm Something that simple and then because we've all experienced this in real life where we were suddenly blinded by the light of realization or recognition of something that was going on in our own lives. Whether it's a toxic, a person in our life that we just realized was toxic or where we suddenly realized how much work we really were doing. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, or even <laughs> even like if if over the course of a couple of years you have been continuously growing as as a person or anything and you don't notice it at that that gradual pace and you pick up a, a diary or even a to-do list or something from years and years ago and you see where you were at that point and then it hits you like just a ton of bricks like how different your life is. Those are all the same moments. That's right. everything coming together very quickly based off of one tiny little thing that suddenly triggers that avalanche. Right, right. That is a beautiful example because that that shows that all of us actually live through this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And there are these moments where you go where you go, "Wow, oh, that's what that meant." But you had been gaining the knowledge all along, and all of a sudden, you see how it comes together. Yeah. 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 And I don't think that, that that question could be better answered in any other way than what you've said as far as they need to get this knowledge a little bit at a time and all throughout right. the book. And it's, it can't just fall on them. They have to earn it. Yeah. They have to work for it. They have to be looking. They have to be actively participating. They can't just trip over things. Yeah. If you if you have any more questions about this, again, go into the thread and ask us, you know, if you if it try to be as specific as possible when it comes to certain things, because then we can get into the nitty gritty and actually, you know, try to figure out from a different perspective what the problem is. But Mm -hmm. is that it for the questions today? That is. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to remind you guys you can follow us on the socials. That is at A-I-A-R-W-I-P on Twitter, at Alone in a Room with Invisible People on Facebook, at Alone with Invisible People on Instagram. You can follow our website, alonewithinvisiblepeople.com, and you can join us in the community. That's hollyswritingclasses.com. And then, you know, if you, if you don't have a free account, just create one. You get the free flash fiction that doesn't suck course. And then you can just find our podcast form, which is listed our podcast along with Invisible People. And just pop in there and talk to everybody. Ask us the questions you have. We have an AMA coming up, which is an Ask Me Anything. I know AMA stands for a whole shitload of things, but that's, that's what <laughs> we're, we're doing the Reddit AMA version. Um <laughs> Not on Reddit, but on our podcast. Yeah, that's and and having been a nurse, I keep hearing American Medical Association, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and there's some other people that that keep hearing other <laughs> things too, and it's like I, I'm sorry. If you'd like to support the podcast, we have a coffee account that's ko hyphen fi dot com forward slash alone. You could also purchase any of Holly's classes, courses, ebooks, clinics, anything from the 
alone with invisible people affiliate links you can go to alone with invisible people.com forward slash support us to figure out all the different ways you can just go into holly's writing classes and support holly as well by purchasing any of these classes you can support us just by sharing as well and of course if you do buy anything from our redbubble shop please tag us in it please because we we love to see the merch we don't have all the merch we have only got a couple of items a piece <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, we love to see you guys out there tag us in whatever you're writing, tag us in, in any of the challenges that we have done that you take on, tag us in your worksheets, any, anything that, that if, if we have helped in any way and you're doing something, let us know. Cause it's, it's part of also why we do this kind of thing is it. And it started with Holly with forward, forward motion years and years and years ago in the 90s. It's, it's part of being that community together and seeing the people that you want to succeed, succeed or take action. It yeah. is one of the more fulfilling parts of doing this kind of thing. Yeah. And we want to know when you have a book out. We want to know when you finished something. Yeah. We, you know, that's important to us because that's why we do this. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, that is it for today. I will just say we love you guys and we will see you next week. Holly, have a wonderful writing week. Kick some ass and uh, I'll see you on the forums. <laughs>